Okay, welcome everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute or two. Um, but just a note on translation, if you'd like to listen into the session in Spanish, you can click uh, the globe at the bottom of your screen and select your language or select more and choose language interpretation. Hola, compañeros y compañeras que se están uniendo, que hablan español. Tenemos la opción de interpretación disponible para esta sesión. Solamente tienen que ir eh, a la parte de abajo del menú, buscar el globito que dice interpretación y seleccionar el, eh, la opción de español. Así que en confianza tenemos interpretación, solo ir al globito y seleccionar la opción de español. Okay, everyone, I think we're going to get started. Um, I'm really happy to have everyone join us for this workshop today. The title of the session is Supporting Campaigns for Immigrant Rights in Pennsylvania. We at the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center and through our We the People campaign are working hard to help envision and move our state towards a place where every resident is valued can meet their basic needs and can live with dignity. And so I'm proud to be part of this session and to be able to lift up the incredible and important work of CASA, the movement of immigrant leaders in Pennsylvania or MILPA and the Driving Pennsylvania Forward campaign. We have a great agenda with some amazing leaders here um, who will share with us information on two campaigns that will significantly improve the quality of life for our immigrant friends and neighbors and will improve the lives of all of us here in Pennsylvania. So one is a campaign aimed at expanding access to driver's licenses to all Pennsylvanians, regardless of immigration status. And the other campaign is aimed at tuition equity, providing in-state tuition for immigrants who reside in Pennsylvania and who are already members of our communities. So we'll also hear from Mason Murtaza, who's a research associate at the Keystone Research Center who will share with us some of his recent research related to these campaigns. He'll kind of pop in and out of the discussion and we'll share research on several of the topics that we're covering today. So I'll briefly introduce our panelists before they speak, but please refer to our speaker bios in the Whova app for more details. So before we get into the agenda, I wanna let folks know that if you have a question at any point during the session, um, please type it into the chat in English or in Spanish, and the chat button is located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll open up the session for questions at the end after all of our speakers have presented. Um, our translator today is Luis Lopez, and he'll be offering simultaneous translation to Spanish speakers in a different Zoom room. And he'll pop over and translate for one of our speakers later in the session who will provide her testimony in Spanish. So to start us off, I'm going to turn it over to um, Luis Loren, who is the statewide coordinator of the Driving PA Forward campaign, and Thais Carrero, who is the Pennsylvania State Director at CASA. They have some opening comments that will help to frame our discussion today. Thank you, Diana. And thank you, everyone, for having us here today. Um, yes, and it's important for us that also this is a, an immigration summit uh, to, to frame this as like, this is a economic and a human rights issue. Uh, immigrants, we, we are part of uh, Pennsylvania. We are part of the society. We are part of the fabric of the society of this country. Uh, and, and that is just a reality. And we are we, we have families. We are, we are, we are your neighbors. You, we, are, we are parents. We are people who go to school with you. Like, we are not uh, this aliens, as we, as we are called. Uh, we are human beings that, that live in this country and uh, not just contribute in, a, in economic ways, but also cultural and also human, uh, human way. Uh, during the pandemic, a lot of our community, immigrant community were uh, helping to, to provide food to, or to, with other type of support, not just to our community, but to everyone around our neighbors and uh, our communities. Uh, um, so that is a, that is key for us to, to say to, that this is a, this is a, a real problem because we, uh, we are part of we are part of the society as families too, right? And uh, when when you said and uh, when in the United States we said 
the uh, families are the, the base and the foundation of the society. Uh, and as strong as the families are, the society will be, well, you are breaking our families, so you are breaking the society. When, uh, when you take uh, people apart and, and their families, when you're the poor parents, when you're the poor kids, you are just breaking the, uh, the, the foundation of the society, mainly a country that is being made uh, out of immigrants and a country who has been built uh, from immigrants. No one, uh, no one but, but anyone, but, but uh, uh, Native Americans are not immigrants in this country. And that is important to remember that we all at some point, uh, someone in our family at some point was an immigrant. And uh, we need to stop the, the, uh, the way to see immigrant as the, the, the other, as the alien that came and take, and uh, we should be scared of. We are part of, we, we are human beings, just like everybody else. And, and it's important for us to frame this as like, this is also an economic and human rights issue that we need to confront and that we need to fix, not just for the, not just for the immigrant community, but for everyone in, in Pennsylvania and everyone in the United States. So with that, I'll pass it to Thais. Thank you, Luis. Uh, a little reminder for the folks that have been joining uh, while we were getting started, we have translation available if you go uh, to the taskbar in your screen, you'll see the interpretation button. Para aquellos que se han unido mientras la llamada estaba comenzando, tenemos eh, interpretación en español. Así que si usted va a la barra que se encuentra en la parte de abajo de, eh, de su pantalla, puede seleccionar el botón de interpretación y seleccionar español para que pueda escuchar la conversación completa en su idioma de preferencia. Uh, and with that, thank you, thank you, Luis, uh, for framing it in such an excellent way. I think while we're going to talk about uh, specific immigration issues today, right, like driver's licenses and tuition equity, I think it's important to recognize that every single issue that has been discussed in the budget summit and that will be discussed, right, as the year progresses, is an immigration issue. When we talk about education, right, and talk about how unfair funding is, those communities that are affected the most are typically people of color, Latinos, immigrants, Black people. So we have to make sure that while we uplift all the campaigns and all the work that needs to be done to fix all the issues that our state is facing, we also uplift the voices of those who are typically left behind, even when we are doing you know, the work of, of fixing all those problems. When it comes to the criminal justice system, right? Uh, it affects immigrants as well. When we talk about climate change, uh, our communities are also living in, in, those, in those places where these environmental justices are taking place. So uh, just emphasizing how important it is to always look further of what we are seeing right in the narratives that uh, are being put out every day because every single issue that we talk about every day is, is also an immigration issue. Like Luis said, uh, these are the families and the folks that kept our food on the table while all the lockdowns were happening. These are the folks that kept our hospitals clean. These are the folks that kept the shelves stocked that were also teaching our students um, in virtual school and, and, and cleaning our hospitals and being you know, doctors and nurses themselves. So uh, we have to, to make sure that we recognize the value of immigrant communities uh, here in Pennsylvania and beyond. And that's what we're here to talk about. So thank you all for, for your interest in this session. And, and we're hoping that you join our efforts both in driver's licenses and tuition equity. Thanks, you guys. Um, okay, before we get into the specific campaigns, um, my colleague, Mesa Murtaza, who is a research associate at the Keystone Research Center, will share some research for us. And while I know it's impossible to quantify the tremendous contributions that immigrants make to our communities across Pennsylvania, he will share some existing data on this. Mesa? Thank you, Diana. Let me... Uh... Share my screen. Does that look okay? All right. 
Um, Sounds great. Everyone. Um, my name is Mason. Uh, as Diana said, I'm a researcher for Keystone Research Center. One of the topics of focus for the past year uh, for me has been immigration research surrounding the foreign-born population in Pennsylvania. And most recently, uh, KRC has been researching the true impact of immigrants on our communities, economy, and industries. And as Diana said, while most of the immense value brought on by the increased diversity is immeasurable by traditional statistics, there are some contributions that we can absolutely measure. Um, and this is what we're gonna attempt to do. So the past year, um, I, and Thais mentioned this briefly, the past year has been truly difficult for everyone around the world. And I think the pandemic has thrown into sharp relief the number of gaps in our support system and our policies. And one such gap is the underappreciated and often underpaid population of essential workers in the frontline industries that you can see in the uh, bar graph. Um, immigrants have long been a crucial part of many of these frontline industries. And now that can be seen with their representation in some of these industries, because while only being a little over 8% of all workers in these industries, uh, all workers overall, the foreign born population in the Commonwealth is overrepresented in half of the frontline industries listed over here. And major contributions from the population can be seen in trucking and warehousing, where they represent 10% of workers in the industry, and building and cleaning services, where they make up almost 19%. 19% uh, of all workers in building clean uh, services are foreign born workers. The, the disproportionate representation doesn't stop for foreign born workers at frontline industries. The population is overrepresented in nearly half of all industries in Pennsylvania, especially waste management and agriculture, where they make up 11 and 13% of workers, respectively. Uh, crucial industries such as manufacturing, waste management, agriculture, transportation, and food services rely and need the contribution of immigrants because they make up nearly 10% or more of each of the listed industries. The, the hardy labor market contribution of the foreign born population isn't a new phenomenon. And over the last 30 years, the percentage of the working age population that is in the workforce for foreign born workers has been increasing. In 1990 and 2000, this percentage for immigrants was slightly lower than the US born population. Um, but since then, in 2019, this, the foreign born individuals over the age of 16 that are in the workforce is almost 68%, which is 6% higher than the percentage of the US born population. A particularly marginalized portion of the foreign born in population, which we'll be focusing on today, are those who are undocumented in Pennsylvania. Undocumented immigrants are afforded no government assistance while actively making large contributions to the state, federal government, along, along with the workforce and our communities. This table represents the output loss in each of Pennsylvania's industries without the contribution of the relatively small undoc undocumented population. Most notably, the Commonwealth would be losing almost 9% of its agricultural output without the undocumented population that work in that industry. Manufacturing would also see a $1.4 billion loss in GDP, and Pennsylvania as a whole would lose $6.4 billion in output as a result of excluding the entire undocumented population. There are, as, as Diana said, and as I've been saying, there are immense contributions even outside of the labor market. Um, immigrants in Pennsylvania have paid $3.3 billion in state and local taxes, along with $6.6 .6 billion in federal uh, taxes during 2019. The undocumented population in Pennsylvania roughly numbers 157,000 people and has con contributed over $134 million to state and local taxes, according to ITEP. That number could be $51 million higher if the population was given a path to full legal status in the future. The economic contributions of immigrants don't stop at taxes, uh, taxes paid or GDP. 
Uh, immigrant households in Pennsylvania have a significant spending power of over $25 billion and the household incomes of almost $35 billion. Immigrants represent 15% of all STEM industry workers in Pennsylvania and make up a total of 62,000 entrepreneurs in the state. Every, everything shown in this presentation is just a fraction of the impact that immigrants can bring, but it's the kind of stuff that we can measure. And we need to begin to understand how important this population is to our communities overall, while contributing disproportionate statistics to our labor market economy, undocumented immigrants and mixed status families are still left out of significant release efforts, government support programs, and even the basic right of effective mobility through access to driver's licenses. Um, and that's, that's the portion of the research that explains some of the immigrant contribution in Pennsylvania. All right, thank you, Mason. Um, so next we're gonna turn to hear about the Driving Pennsylvania Forward campaign. Um, and first I'd like to introduce Yvonne Pinto, who is a leader and promoter with the Movement of Immigrant Leaders in Pennsylvania, or MILPA. Yvonne will be speaking to us in Spanish and then our translator, Luis Lopez, will translate her presentation into English. Welcome, Yvonne. Muchas gracias, Diana. Muchas gracias a todos por este día. ¿Sí me veo bien? Perfecto. Gracias. Soy de origen mexicana. Llegué a los Estados Unidos hace 15 años y durante esos años he tenido muchos logros y obstáculos que he vencido con esfuerzos. Me he forzado, me he formado mi familia y al pasar el tiempo me he integrado e interesando más en mi comunidad. Soy una mujer trabajadora que me he dado cuenta que tengo talentos para realizar varios trabajos los cuales no sabía que podía realizar. Soy una mujer que trabaja en equipo y que busca tener una red de apoyo para mi familia y amigos. Sin embargo, aún con todas esas oportunidades que me ha brindado la vida, al final del día me doy cuenta que no puedo realizarlas al 100% como otros residentes de Pensilvania. La libertad de movimiento no es solo caminar y dar paseos, es sentirse seguro al realizar, al regresar a casa. Y lo siento, ando un poco nerviosa. Es muy emotivo para mí estar aquí hoy con ustedes. Prosigo. Uh, es seguro y regresarme a mi casa después de un paseo. Eh, la oportunidad de buscar trabajo es un, y para darme un futuro mejor para mí y para mi familia en otros lugares si fuera necesario. Yo no puedo dar un paseo, agarrar un auto y llevar a mi hija a explorar la naturaleza por un bosque. Esto para mí no es posible de hacer como para otros residentes de Pensilvania porque me aterra pensar que podría ser parada por un policía y entonces mi hija tendría que ver a, mi, que ver a su mamá arrestada y deportada por la falta de una licencia de conducir. He dejado pasar muchas oportunidad, oportunidades de trabajo, trabajo que sería bueno en mi crecimiento personal y familiar. Pod poder tomar cursos o capacitaciones laborales se han quedado solo en un papel escrito, ya que no tengo la misma libertad de utilizarlos por falta de una licencia o una identificación estatal. Esta es la historia de mi vida, pero también es la de otros cientos de personas en Pensilvania, como las de mis hermanos trabajadores, agrícolas, trabajadores en restaurantes, construcción, cuidado de niños que han sido llamados esenciales y se ven limitados. Sufren por no tener la seguridad de ir a laborar a donde se les ofrece un trabajo digno. Es arriesgarse a ser explotados, mal pagados y sin derechos médicos por, no mencio por mencionar algunos. Y eso es por no tener una licencia de manejo. Estamos luchando por una vida digna y, di y segura para todos los residentes de Pensilvania, sin importar de dónde venimos o quiénes somos. Ser, mi, ser, um, ser miembro de MILPA me ha dado la oportunidad de buscar caminos 
de trabajar con mis hermanos en la comunidad de Pensilvania para un bien común como la igualdad, los derechos humanos, la libertad de movimiento, de viajar y abrazar a los seres queridos. Nuestra lucha no puede quedar en espera. Creemos y sabemos que con su apoyo tendremos una victoria to donde todos saldremos beneficiados. Podríamos tener una mejor vida económica, una educación vial y lo más importante, vidas y familias a salvo. Ser parte de la coalición Manejando Pensilvania, Palante y Milpa me han ayudado a ser mejor organizadora, mejor vecina, educarme para tener herramientas y luchar por nuestros derechos y por un mejor y una mejor vida con la respuesta, con la propuesta HB 279 y con su apoyo, sé que se haría realidad. Seremos una sola voz. Seremos más fuertes porque el corazón de nuestra Pensilvania es nuestra comunidad. Nosotros somos Pensilvania. Nosotros manejamos Pensilvania para adelante. Gracias. Soy de origen mexicana. Llegué hasta... Um, I'm born in Mexico. I arrived in the United States 15 years ago. During those years, I've had many achievements and obstacles that I've overcome with great effort. I've built a family and over time I've become integrated and interested more in my community. I am a hardworking woman and I've realized that I have talents to do several jobs and several kinds of work that I didn't know I was capable of doing. I am a woman who works as part of a team and who seeks a support network for my family and friends. But however, even with all these opportunities that life has given me, at the end of the day, I realize that I can't carry them out. I can't live them 100% as other residents of Pennsylvania can. The freedom of movement, it's not just being able to walk around and take a stroll. It's feeling safe while returning home. It's the opportunity to seek a better future for me and my family in other places if necessary. I can't go take a stroll. I can't take a car and take my daughter to explore nature in the forest. That for me is not something possible as it is for other residents of Pennsylvania because I am terrified thinking that I could be stopped by the police and then my daughter would have to see her mother arrested and deported for lacking a driver's license. I've let many opportunities, job opportunities slip by, work that would have been good for my personal and family's growth, to be able to take courses or training in work skills that just remains only on paper because I don't have the same freedom to use them as I lack a license or an, a state ID. This is the history, this is the story of my life, but also it's the story of hundreds of other people's lives in Pennsylvania, as the, such as the lives of my worker brothers and sisters in agriculture, restaurant workers, construction workers, childcare workers who have been called essential, but see, but face great limitations, suffering for not having the security of being able to go to work where they are offered work with dignity, which is running a risk by, which means running the risk of being exploited, poorly paid and lacking medical rights because, just to mention a few, and that's because they don't have a driver's license. We're fighting for a life with dignity and safety for all residents of Pennsylvania, no matter where we come from or who we are. Being a member of MILPA, has given me the opportunity to seek new paths, to work with my sisters and brothers of the Pennsylvania community for the common good, such as equality, human rights, freedom of movement, and to travel and to hug your loved ones. Our fight cannot stay 
any longer on the sidelines. We can no longer wait. We believe and we know that with your support, we'll achieve a victory where we all benefit. We'll be able to have a better life, better economy, um, driver education, and most importantly, safe lives and families. Being part of the coalition for driving Pennsylvania forward and MILPA has helped me to be a better organizer, a better neighbor, and to educate myself to have tools and to fight for our rights and to improve our quality of life. With uh, Proposition HB 279, which will become a reality with your support, we will have a single voice, we'll be stronger, and because the heart of our Pennsylvania is our community. We are Pennsylvania. We are driving Pennsylvania forward. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Matham, um, who's gonna talk a little bit about his research on um, the campaign for driver's licenses, access to driver's licenses, Matham. Thank you, Diana. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the report that KRC did around expanding driver's license to undocumented immigrants. Uh, it was initially based entirely on the idea that mobility is a basic right and access to driver's license would make the lives of immigrants significantly easier. And as the report progressed, one of the research questions I wanted to answer was, who, who are we helping? There was an obvious answer in the undocumented population who needed driver's licenses. Um, and that's what these first few fly, uh, slides explore. But the answer the research kept pointing to was everyone, especially those who can't uh, complete the basic errands or tasks without taking a risk in Pennsylvania. But the main idea was that this ends up helping everybody, uh, all of our communities and all of, all of the people who work in them. Um, so the first thing, we can see is that most of the families being helped are have a household income of 200% below the poverty line, which for a single person, I believe is about $25,700. Um, so we're helping low income families complete the basic tasks a lot easier as can be seen here. The licenses wouldn't only aid lower income families, but also those with children roughly 27% of eligible, meaning the ages over 16 of the undocumented population in Pennsylvania reside with children. Something as simple as a school event or a doctor's appointment or a trip to the grocery store would be made risk-free and much easier for these families uh, if we, we were to expand access to driver's licenses. Of, of the potential uh, new driver's license holder, nearly a third are married and, and access to a driver's licenses, again, will make the essential choices that come with having a family much easier, allowing for a greater contribution to the community they live in, a greater contribution to the local economy. And um, with the next slide, we can see that there's a significant number of licenses that would be registered if, if we were to expand um, access to them. Other states are ahead of Pennsylvania on driver's license expansions and have studied the take-up rates of these policies within the first three years of implementation. The Commonwealth would have an additional 82,000 dri uh, licensed drivers on the road, making the roads much safer, holding more dri licensed drivers accountable, um, and overall improving uh, the community. The other two, the bar graphs are for Pennsylvania as a whole, which is 82,000 driver's licenses and Philadelphia County and Chester County, which are the other two counties with significant numbers of undocumented immigrants residing in them. Like, like many of the contributions listed in the previous section, the true impact of policies like this are, are mostly immeasurable but with almost no additional cost to the state. Uh, Pennsylvania can have over 20,000 new cars purchased and an additional $13 million in state tax revenue as a result of this policy. Tax revenue that comes from the liquid fuels tax, uh, consumption sales tax from the existing vehicles and, and the new vehicles that would be purchased, additional revenue from increased registrations uh, for the driver's license fees and 
the true impact of expanding driver's licenses will be in safer streets with more licensed drivers, the contributions that would be made easier on immigrant families, and the benefits to the local economy through better job matching while accruing no additional cost for the state. Uh, this is a clear cut way to expand a basic right to a portion of Pennsylvania's population that contributes disproportionately and enriches our community with, uh, with everything that they contribute to the labor market, to taxes, um, and, and to, the, to the local culture. And I'll hand it back over to Diana. All right, thanks, Mason. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Luis Loren, who's the statewide coordinator of the Driving Pennsylvania Forward Coalition. Um, and just a word about Luis. I have known Luis actually for quite a many years now um, where our work overlapped doing economic human rights work when he um, was an organizer at Workers United in Baltimore. And I have been thrilled um, you know, since he's moved to Pennsylvania, because I know, you know, when he's done with us, um, our state and all of us will be um, better because of his work and his dedication. So I'll turn it over to Luis. Thank you, Diana. Thank you so much for uh, that, uh, that introduction. And yes, as Diana said, we, we, we know each other for a long time and working on all this uh, important work of uh, economic human rights and, uh, and, uh, um, and, uh, and how can we, uh, come united, uh, that's the most important thing. And not united just in the solidarity uh, type of uh, uh, way, but uh, in an ideological way, in a way that really move our society forward, in a way that, that really transform and change our world and change you know, how do we function and how do we see things. So it's been a really honor to be part of the uh, uh, Driving Pennsylvania Forward Coalition now. And um, let me, can I share my screen? It says that I can't. Hold on one uh, second. Louis, do you... Let me okay. double check. Luis, you should be able to uh, share your screen now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Let me uh, bring out my PowerPoint. There you go. So yeah, I will I'll, I'll, uh, I will tell you I'll tell a little bit more about what the Driving Pennsylvania Forward Coalition is. So. Uh, this is uh, this is these are the organizations, the uh, main anchor organizations who are uh, who who are building the the coalition right now. And these organizations take uh, part in different ways in terms of develop the narrative, develop the strategy for our campaign, and, and uh, to how do we move Pennsylvania forward. Um, so who we are. Uh, it's, uh, it's a coalition that is very diverse. We, we have a, a different type of uh, organizations so from advocacy to faith, business, farmers, labor, community organizations um, who, are, who are building this, uh, uh, this coalition. And uh, the most important thing is prioritize the leadership of the immigrant community. Uh, while we welcome everyone else who uh, believe that this is important work, we also want to make sure that our community as immigrant community uh, build that political power to, to grassroots or legislative efforts and change what is politically possible. Um, we don't see your problems as uh, something isolated. We don't see that uh, this is a immigrant rights issue. This is an issue that, that brings us all together. So um, as we are seeing the, an economic crisis, uh, that every year we talk about economic crisis, every year we talk about a fiscal, uh, fiscal emergency, every year we, we heard the same things over and over. But for decades, all communities, uh, not just the Indian community, but our, our, our communities of color and, and poor communities are, uh, are living in, in this uh, uh, economic crisis. Um, for the immigrant community that goes even beyond when, when the, they don't have access to a driver's license and by, because they are trying to have a, a better life as, as uh, Yvonne was explaining or just taking the kids to the doctor or, or going to doing uh, like the normal things that we all enjoy to do, they are risk we are risking deportation. Um, at the same time that we are seeing poverty dependent in our communities, we also see how the surveillance is, is uh, going up in our communities and how we are being more uh, surveilled by, by uh, not just the government, but also by uh, other organizations. And um, while we, our communities, are struggling to meet those basic needs, those companies who are 
keeping us on uh, under surveillance, they are making billions by selling our identity and selling our data uh, without our knowledge or consent. And the government or government is facilitating that process, um, which it is a complete violation to our privacy, a complete violation to our security for everyone, not just for the uh, undocumented immigrant community. The, the solution that we see is uh, organized, as uh, Yvonne was mentioning, right? Like uh, that is or, or that's that, that's the only thing that we can do, really, organize and uh, and fight back. Um, not organize just as a immigrant community, but organize as Pennsylvanians, organize as a, a country, organize as a group of people who know that that we need and deserve something better. Uh, in terms of the driver licenses, uh, we know that the, this fight, this struggle that we have, is not unique to Pennsylvania. This uh, has been this uh, fight has been fought in other in other states, uh, and currently these states are the ones who uh, have, have access to driver licenses for undocumented immigrants. Some of those states have a really strong privacy protections. Other states are introducing legislation that is separate from the driver license to protect the privacy of, uh, of all the residents of those states. As you see, Pennsylvania is pretty much surrounded at this point by, by other states who are uh, having this type of legislation. So it's time for Pennsylvania to take to, to follow, you know, at this point is not taking the lead. At this point is to, to follow what is, uh, what is right, what uh, is moral. Um, Going a little bit quick into the history of the driver license in Pennsylvania for uh, immigrants, in, until 2001, uh, undocumented immigrants were able to have driver access to driver licenses. Uh, unfortunately, the 9-11 attacks happened and that opened the door for not just Pennsylvania, but other states to pass this uh, really harmful uh, uh, legislations that were uh, anti-immigrants and based on fear and based on uh, just an excuse to, to use racism against the, our communities. In 2009, things went even farther when Pen, uh, PennDOT retroactively canceled uh, thousands of those driver licenses that, was, that were obtained before uh, previously. And also there was, a, there was a court case that was won. Unfortunately, since the law changed, then uh, the, the, the driver licenses couldn't be renewed or more people could, weren't able to have new driver licenses. In 2013 was when the first time in Pennsylvania the, the legislation was introduced with the support of Representative Mark Cohen. And then in 2017, with the Real ID Act, Pennsylvania uh, created these two different types of driver, the, uh, driver license and ID, the, the Real ID and a standard driver license. And that opened the door for us to say that is the driver license that we can have access to. We don't want a marked driver license. We don't want to create a tier level of residents in Pennsylvania. There is the way to, to do this in the right way. In 2018 was when the coalition uh, formed, and uh, then in 2019, 2020, was the uh, building political power over 15 counties organizing uh, on those communities allows to uh, introduce the legislation HB 2845 with uh, Representative Burgos and Representative Rav. We introduced this legislation late in the game and uh, it was about power. We introduced the legislation in August, and by uh, November, at, at the end of, by August 25th, we introduced the legislation. And by November, we had uh, over 30 sponsors, including two Republicans. Uh, so that just gives you a sense of like this legislation, we were organizing in those counties, we were organizing in those districts, and that's where we get those sponsors. And then what happened now in 2021? 2021, we have HB 279 and SB 54. For today, we are talking mainly about HB 279, but SB 54 is exactly the same bill. Uh, it's just that the House have much more uh, uh, numbers at the end of the day that we need to uh, that we need to get to pass this legislation. Under this legislation, uh, we'll be allowed to use the tax ID number to obtain a driver license. Tax ID and or other forms of identification. We wanna make sure that we are including those parents who stay at home and that are unpaid labor that our society oversee all the time. We don't want to get this driver license to who the serves, but, uh, but, uh, but treat everyone as human beings. Um, but we, that, that's one of the points. And then also it, this legislation includes protections to our personal information, preventing that ICE have access to, to our information. As uh, right now, ICE is having access to information, uh, to your information uh, that is in PENDAT. Also, immigrants, uh, undocumented immigrants don't have access to driver licenses, yet ICE is having access to that, that, that database. Um, 
and uh, obtain a standard driver license or a state ID. That again, that is not different from what any other resident can obtain. Um, what this legislation will create is this, what we call the three tiers of safety or the three-dimensional safety, safety in the roads, safety in our, for our privacy and protect our families. Uh, as, uh, as was mentioned before, the more, uh, the more people who have a driver license that have passed the test, that have learned the, 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 the rules, that have a car insurance, the, the, uh, the more safe that the roads will be. Uh, the, if for uh, privacy, if our private information is protected, we all will feel more protected. None of us live in a in a house made of uh, walls out of uh, glass, right? Because we all uh, want our privacy. We all have the right to have our privacy. Uh, but when when this is not being protected, we we need to take uh, steps forward and protect our families, keep our families safe. And that is the other part that is very important for this that, that this bill will will, uh, will provide. I will skip the economic impact because uh, as we already uh, have a very comprehensive uh, explanation of the economic impact that this bill will have. Um, so I will just jump to the next part of like where we at at this point. The uh, HB 279 currently have 40 co-sponsors including two Republicans, Representative Quinn and Representative um, Hershey. So it's important for us to keep building that, uh, that bipartisan um, of, uh, support. And we are doing that by organizing in those in those uh, districts, the organizing in a, in any district where our community is part of. Um, to put things in perspective, in order to do this legislation get out of the transportation committee, we need 13 votes, including three Republicans. Uh, and to pass the, the House, we will need 102 votes, and that will be assuming that all Democrats will vote in favor and also 12 Republicans. So. Uh, this is where the it's important to to bring the rest of the community of Pennsylvania together and really find a way to um, uh, to pass this legislation by, with the support of uh, uh, both parties. Right now, this is uh, the, uh, I pretty quick will pass to, to this like what are what are our, our uh, objectives or our targets for in terms of legislators. Uh, first is the leadership in the House. Um, as, as we know, we need to get, get their support in order to really pass this legislation in a, in a way that, that benefits our community and that is not watered down. Um, and the other part that we really need to also to put pressure on is the Transportation Committee. Last year, Representative Tim Hennessy supported this legislation. Uh, he is the chair of the Transportation Committee. So this year we are, we are calling on him to support this legis legislation again as he did last year. Um, these are all the uh, members of the transportation committee who we need to uh, to move to support this legislation as soon as possible. Um, so, how can we? How can you join? How? What can you do to support this bill uh, or support this campaign? You can call, send a letter to your legislator, uh, and ask them to sponsor the bill. If they already uh, sponsored the bill, uh, thank them for for that. And uh, I will paste on the chat the the link where you can check uh, who is already sponsor of the bill. Uh, we also have a petition that and uh, support for bill. I will also paste that in uh, in the chat. Don't worry. All these links, all the sign-ons, I will paste it on the chat uh, for you to to follow the, those links. Um, we have also community outreach, including phone banking. Uh, I will add my my email. You can contact us. We have a couple of organizations who have weekly phone banking uh, sessions that are being virtual for now. So you can you can join us uh, from anywhere that, where you are. Um, we are very active in social media. We have uh, currently we are in 40 days uh, of uh, actions, including the including letters, letter writing, and uh, sharing videos. So it, or we are sharing videos from not just the immigrant community, but from Pennsylvanians saying why this is important, why supporting HB 279 is important. So you can follow us on Facebook and share that all of that information with with us. And um, if you want to be more connected every third Monday of the month, we have a, a webinar where we give updates on our, in our legislative strategy as well in our organizing strategy. So you can be always connected with what is going on and what is the, the uh, newest thing happening. And, uh, and lastly, you can also visit our website and donate. Uh, there is where we have a, a lot of more information and you can also donate. So thank you so much. And I think we'll have questions later. So I'll pass it back to Diana. Thanks so much, Luis. Um, 
Okay, so now we're going to turn to the campaign led by CASA on tuition equity. And I'm happy to introduce Orlando Miranda, who's a CASA member, and he's going to um, kick us off here. Um, Y'all can hear me, right? Yes. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Orlando Miranda. I'm a CASA member. And today I would like to uh, share my story of a young immigrant as well um, of a young immigrant that um, came to this country for a better future and to seek a better education that I was not given back in my home country. And as well, not to share my story, but share the, so many of the stories that you are here or have heard before and to make it more clear and louder. Um, I was born in Mexico City and for the first years of my life that I've been there, I was, um, I was just little when my parents have left me and uh, came first to the country. Uh, sadly, I could have not joined them when they first made the journey and only my sister was able to go with them since she was a US citizen born and I was left behind. Uh, through those years, uh, it was hard for me and it was hard for my family to be separated. Uh, Later, uh, at the age of nine, I was able to give in. My parents have made an arrange, arrangement for me to come to the country and finally be reunited with my family and to become one as my parents have always dreamed of. Um, my story, it is not, it, it may be or may not be similar like uh, others that you have heard. Uh, for me, I have graduated from New Oxford High School two years ago and currently, I am not a uh, college student. Uh, technically, I'm a dropout. On my first day of college, student, on my first day of college, um, I was very excited. I was very happy. I was actually going to be the first uh, member in my family to graduate high school and be able to go to college. Um, I remember that day when my parents actually took me to my uh, college in uh, Gettysburg Hack Community College. Uh, they took pictures. They were really happy for me. Uh, and they say that to give my best and to look forward to um, my future. The day, just standard things as uh, college for first day. And at the end of the day, uh, I was brought up to the office when uh, I was given the notice and information of how much my tuition was gonna cost of the career that I wanted to choose and pursue, which was uh, political science, uh, which is a career that inspired me at a young age when I started learning the formation of a country that we live in. Um, during that day, uh, I was set down and I was talked to the, um, I believe it was the um, money management of the college. And the lady told me that sadly due to my immigration status, I could not uh, have government aid or any sort of help. And that my tuition fee was going to be a little bit more higher compared to the other ones. Uh, I remember that day also that my parents were waiting for me outside and she asked me if those were my parents and they said, I said yes. Uh, of course, she asked me to brought them in. We had a conversation and my parents asked me to introduce for them, uh, to interpret it for them. For them to hear that I was gonna be paying more than the regular US citizen and I was not gonna be given the opportunity to uh, have help from our government was a very sad day. Uh, not only for me, but for my family as well who had dreamed of me to become that first generation student to be able to graduate from high school and be able to go into college. Uh, ever since then, I've been, uh, working job after job, uh, did working midnight hours. Sometimes I've been putting sometimes 12 hours to shift, sometimes even longer hours than I should have because I needed the money to be able to pay my tuition because I'm still not giving up on that dream. I'm still saving more money to be able to complete, to be able to, to pay my full tuition. Uh, I'm not giving up. 
Um, honestly, I am very proud to be here with all of you. I do know, <laughs> I do know that I sound a little bit nervous, but this nervous comes from my bravery, my bravery who has inspired me to not only speak up for myself, but to also speak up for those students who also are in the same situation as me. Um, what I want uh, from all of you is not only to listen to my story, but also to consider this um, bill that will help me and so many other students who are in the same situation as me. We want a better future. We want a better education. We want able to have access to all of those um, opportunities that regular USA citizens get to have. And with that, and if we don't have those, we're not gonna be able to complete our dreams that we, are, um, that we want to accomplish. That is our American dream. That is my American dream of first uh, immigrant generation to be able to graduate from high school and be able to go to college. That's what we want to do. We want to be able to pursue careers that not only will help us, but us help our community who need help. Uh, and for that, I pleading you and asking you for, please consider this bill. Do not only do this for me and for the rest of so many other students who are in need in the situation that I am, but as well do it because you're helping make a better future and that better future will lead this country to a better place that we are or that we have been before. And to that, I thank you for your time and have a good afternoon. Thank you, Orlando. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Orlando. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to me. Thank you, uh, thank you, Diana. Um, so, one second. Um, so, the the report on tuition equity that KRC is working on is still upcoming. It's being uh, part of it is doing the background research for potentially other states that have done this, and and if any work around this exists in Pennsylvania on the on the research end and. Um, this, this was a report, we kind of thought of the three reports, the contribution report, the driver's license report, and then the tuition equity report that came from uh, my, my own experience of being an immigrant student in, in Pennsylvania. I, I obviously, I wasn't undocumented, but um, because of my immigrant status, I wasn't allowed to, uh, to work. I was not allowed to accept any federal aid. Um, and if it wasn't my for my parents' career in academia, I would have been weighed down with significant uh, high interest private loans for my college education. And even that is an option that I would have had um, what some people don't because it requires a cosigner. So this, this is the portion of life that we would like to make easier for um, the 50,000, the over 50,000 international students that are currently in the Pennsylvania schools and all future immigrant students. Uh, the economic contribution of these international students is over $2 billion and their tuition payments and consumption support over 25,000 uh, 25, jobs in Pennsylvania. Um, while all immigrants other than those who have green cards cannot count on government financial aid, uh, a portion of them can't even rely on paying the lower in-state tuition rate in Pennsylvania because of their lack of documentation. Um, go here. Despite these challenges, immigrants in Pennsylvania have a higher percentage of their population that acquire either a bachelor's or graduate degrees than the US born populations. Making a college education more accessible for this portion of the population would lead to a high, highly educated community with less debt weighing them down upon graduation. And basically we wanted to explore because this, these are statistics for the overall international student population. And for the purposes of this campaign, we wanted to research um, other states that have tuition equity laws and the results that they, those states have had. So as of 2021, 21 states and uh, DC have tuition equity laws that allow immigrant students that meet a specific eligibility to pay in-state tuition rate. 
these eligibility rules often differ, but they uh, many times they include uh, attending a school in a state for a specified number of years or having graduated high school or obtained a GED in the state that you're applying in college for. Uh, alongside these tuition equity laws, more states have started to open state financial aid grants to immigrant students with similar status. Uh, these laws can benefit at least 17% of the uh, Pennsylvania's undocumented population that is in the college age range, along with the additional 7% who's under the age of 16 that would be able to take full advantage of the opportunities uh, tuition equity laws would provide in the future. Uh, a number of states, as I said, have already enacted similar laws and have the results to show for it. For example, the Texas Dream Act has resulted in a total of 64 million in tuition and fees paid by the students who benefited specifically from those in-state tuition rates uh, or the level of financial aid provided to them. Those students received a total of 12 million in state funded grants compared to the 64 million they ended up contributing to the schools overall. Um, Texas also found that the median income for immigrants with college degrees was higher by 156%. And the Texas Dream Act resulted in higher levels of economic and tax contribution. Um, in, in many cases, uh, the reason we looked at Texas was because it was a big example. And the problem with that was the Texas undocumented population is really large. In fact, I think it's the second biggest in the United States outside of California. Uh, we wanted to, the results were phenomenal, but given that their population, uh, undocumented population is over 1.7 million, much larger than the roughly 160,000 undocumented in Pennsylvania. Uh, I wanted to look at something that was a little bit closer to Pennsylvania in terms of population that had also enacted tuition equity laws. Uh, Maryland has an undocumented population of about 226,000 and has a study on their own DREAM Act. And the net economic benefit in Maryland of the legislation was about 25 million. And the cost of implementing was negligible in either state. Uh, both Texas and Maryland cited the benefits, uh, cited one of the benefits of this legislation as a well-educated community and more accessible college education. Results included greater job satisfaction, increased tax revenues, larger economic contribution through consumption and greater growth rate uh, through less brain drain, which is a number that can be improved in the immigrant population because according to the Migration Policy Institute, about 20% of college educated foreign born labor force feels underutilized, underemployed or employed in low skilled jobs. Um, so the, the research work on tuition equity is the next large report being worked on KRC and it will support the legislative campaign surrounding the topic to make college more accessible for immigrants and continue to give all members of our uh, communities more opportunities. And uh, I'll hand it back over to Diana now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mason. Um, so we're going to hear from one more speaker before we open it up for a question and answer. Um, Thais Carrera, who's Pennsylvania State Director of CASA. Thank you. Let me work this out. Can you all see that and hear me well? All good. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mason, for that data. Um, this is certainly something that we're looking forward to because it'll it'll help us right move the campaign to the next level in order to uh, bring those folks that are kind of like on the fence on the right thing to do here. Uh, my name is Thais Carrero. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the state director for CASA, the largest immigrant organization uh, in Pennsylvania, working in seven counties in central and southeast uh, Pennsylvania. Um, this actually, you know, just like every other campaign uh, that I know Driving PA Forward, Milpa, Casa, and other grassroots organizations uh, have worked on is it emerges from, from our members, right? Uh, we, we meet regularly, we talk in our comites, in our community meetings, and discuss what are the issues that are affecting our communities, and then we find ways to uh, create solutions for those issues. And in this campaign, you know, no different. That's how it was born. 
Um, uh, there it is. So why tuition equity? Number one, and we all know this, right? It's the right thing to do. Uh, these uh, folks uh, that are, are asking for, for pretty much fair treatment, right? Uh, have been calling Pennsylvania home pretty much for their entire life. So it is only fair that we can provide them with an opportunity to continue furthering their education. Um, we can raise revenue for our higher education system and for Pennsylvania's economy, just like as, as Mason referenced in the previous presentation. Uh, we, can, we, we can hear uh, fairly often how much, uh, especially our PASHI system, right, our, our state schools are, are struggling because of low en uh, enrollment rates, because uh, of how high the tuition is, right? So we can see this as a way to not only raise revenue uh, and contribute to Pennsylvania's economy in general, but also to keep those systems of, of public higher education accessible. Uh, and then reduce brain drain uh, and fill the jobs that go unfilled uh, year after year. We know of students uh, and, and members of our communities that go to these other places where legislation like this uh, is in place because it's, because it's cheaper, because it's more affordable and because they have more access to, to financial aid. And then once they have that, it's just hard to bring them back uh, to contribute right in their in their home state. So that's one of the reasons. And then uh, just so you have an idea, this is one of the, this is an example of one of the PASHI schools. Uh, you can tell the difference between, you know, someone that is considered a Pennsylvania resident and someone that is considered a non-Pennsylvania resident uh, or an international student, right? Uh, it's more than double the amount that they have they have to pay. And we know that this only or, or this uh, legislation and campaign alone are not necessarily going to fix the problem, right? We have to, as we were referencing at the very beginning of this session, uh, we have to think about uh, all other campaigns, right? All other proposals that are in, in place right now to fund education equitably to give access to, you know, uh, college to all Pennsylvanians, we have to make sure that when we talk about all Pennsylvanians, we're also talking about uh, immigrant students, documented or not, because we know that they contribute in a very uh, similar way, the same way. Um, so talk about the PA promise, right? Uh, a bill that has been introduced several times. We want to make sure that legislation like that is able to apply to immigrant students. When we talk about the Nellie Bly scholarship program that the governor proposed, we wanna make sure that those, uh, those proposals include uh, immigrant students as well. This fight uh, has been in the work for many years, but on January 1st of 2020, beginning of you know that incredible year, uh, we actually heard very good news coming out of Penn State after a meeting that uh, Casa and our members had with the governor and, and some additional conversations with the board of trustees from, from Penn State. Uh, just probably after two, three weeks of that meeting, uh, Penn State actually rolled out a policy uh, basing their in-state tuition raise, um, rates only on uh, the residency uh, requirement, right? Based just on, on the fact that folks live in Pennsylvania and not on their citizenship uh, or immigration status. And that's what we want to expand. That's what we want to make sure that uh, not just state related universities, but uh, our, our PASHI system and our community colleges can offer to all immigrant students. So we worked with um, the the Welcoming Caucus at the State House of Representatives, several other organizations to create this legislation that uh, is enhanced, right, from past versions that have been introduced. This new legislation is going to allow students that graduate from Pennsylvania high schools or attended two years of, of high schools or got their GEDs or other uh, equivalency uh, 
certifications eligible to receive in-state tuition rates, community colleges, PASHI, and private universities that receive state funds. So that's that's your Temple, that's your um, that's your Penn State, etc. So we want to make sure that uh, not just us, because what tends to happen is that you know folks try to limit the amount of immigrants who can access uh, you know, certain resources. And we, as we all learned today, we all contribute to the economy in the same way. So it is only fair that we have access to those resources. This uh, legislation will include all immigrants. So undocumented students, folks with DACA, folks with TPS, DED, uh, visas and refugee students. We know that private uh, pre previous versions of the bill uh, we're actually uh, limiting the amount of folks who were eligible uh, for in-state tuition rates. Um, in addition to that, it would uh, extend state funded financial aid to uh, all students. So talking about uh, our FIAs, right? And it would also create an alternate process because we know that at this point, even if folks have some type of you know, uh, temporary permit like DACA, TPS, um, or any other, uh, you know, authorization that gives them a social security, they are still not able to access federal student aid or even fill out a FAFSA form. So that's why in order to provide uh, accurate and good access to, uh, to FIA state assistance, uh, we need to create an alternate um, application process. And then of course, uh, just like driver's licenses, we always want to make sure that the information uh, and the privacy of uh, the folks is always first and front and center. So we included language there to make sure that, you know, everything related to this particular uh, legislation and law, when it becomes law, because we know it will, uh, is only used for the purposes of administrating the program and not shared with any other uh, outside entities. Um, we have been working in collaboration with Senator Judy Schrock and uh, Representative Pete Schreier, who have been uh, the folks who have been introducing this uh, bill in the past. And now with, you know, the help of uh, several community organizations and members of our community, we have actually strengthened this bill to make it better and more inclusive. Uh, so. Representative Pete Schweier already introduced his uh, co-sponsor memo and we're working, you know, meeting uh, at a very fast pace with, with folks to get more uh, co-sponsors and the same uh, at the, in the Senate, uh, working with uh, Senator Judy Schrank on uh, finalizing uh, the, the language to make sure that it is what our communities are, are asking for. Uh, in order to introduce it and same thing, get more and more legislation, more, more and more legislators and more and more support from the broader community. Um, we know that we're just getting started, right? Uh, we took the, the time to take this bill to the community and rewrite it uh, so that we all have this sense of, of, of belonging, right? That what is happening at the state level with this, these pieces of legislation is actually what we want uh, and that we can all work together to make it happen. Um, and then with that, how can you help? Uh, we're gonna be uh, pretty much doing everything from phone banking to letters, to calls, to events, to virtual town halls, and we're gonna need all the help that we can. So I encourage you all to visit wearecasa.org uh, slash get involved and sign up so you can stay up to date because we, uh, we will certainly let you know what's happening so you can take action uh, with us to make this happen for our communities. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Diana. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thanks to all of our speakers today. We have about maybe five minutes um, for a question and answer session. So I was going to turn over the question and answer segment of our workshop to my colleague, Ricardo Amodavar. 
um, who will facilitate it. So if, if anyone has a question, you can either raise your hand or um, and and then come off of mute. Ricardo. Hi. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm here if anyone has any questions, please ask them in the chat and we'll be happy to have the presenters answer them. Thank you for joining us. Are there any questions? We did an excellent job then. <laughs> Um, is uh, Lila here or you said Lila was going to be joining us? No, no, creo que la venga. no, creo que oh, Lila okay. venga. But, um, I, I mean, I understand that this might be a lot to digest, right? Um, in some, for some of us, it might be the first time that we're hearing this, uh, this information. I just want to say how how grateful I am that all of you uh, responded to to this call and that are looking for ways to support the work that um, immigrant communities are doing across the state. Um, if there is any if there are any questions, feel free to uh, put them in the chat or unmute yourself. And if not, uh, just you know, go on social media, go to our websites and, and see what we're doing, right? And send us a message and we can hook you up with something that we know you will enjoy uh, and, and something that will help us move all these campaigns forward. All right, thank you so much, Thais. Um, so it looks like there aren't any questions or it's, do I see a question from Mirna Gonzalez or are you clapping to say thank you? It's a clap. It was an awesome oh. presentation. And so, yeah, thank you for all what you're doing. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you to everyone. I'll just say a couple. Um, I have a couple comments to close us out. Um, you know, obviously, I just want to really thank our panelists for sharing your stories, sharing information about your campaigns, um, and for your ongoing work to make Pennsylvania a better state for all of us. Um, I also wanna thank all of our listeners today. Thanks for joining us. Um, we really appreciate your participation in this year's budget summit and we value your feedback. So um, if you wouldn't mind, there is um, you could take a minute or two and give us your thoughts about this workshop using the Whova app. That helps us as we continue to to plan for you know future summits like this and, and workshops. Um, if you missed any part of this workshop session or are interested in what was presented in today's other workshop, um, there will be video recordings of both workshops and copies of all the slides that were presented today, um, and that'll be available on the Whova app later this afternoon. Um, and we hope to see you online at 1 p.m. next. Thursday, April 1st, for our third and final workshop sessions. Uh, we have two great sessions that day at one o'clock. One is organizing and mobilizing during a pandemic, pro tips from the We the People PA campaign and partners. And our second workshop is called Reimagine Appalachia towards a climate infrastructure stimulus that kicks kickstarts a new deal that works for us in the Ohio, Ohio River Valley, Valley State. Sorry, that was a mouthful. <laughs> um, so following those workshops, the closing plenary next week, um, I think at 2.30, uh, will be a panel discussion featuring progressive champions in the General Assembly of Pennsylvania um, and details about um, those workshops and that legislative panel can be found again on the Whova conference app. So again, thanks to everyone for participating today and we'll see you next Thursday. Thank you all. Thank you, Orlando. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, Luis. Welcome. Thank you, PBPC and with the people. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Hello. Thanks.